Marga, I think uh, you can start. So the floor is yours. And thanks a lot uh, for your availability again. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Simone, for your presentation. And thanks everybody for for being there and sharing um, listening. No? Uh, well, I, I would like to give an overview to the um, environmental module. It's a quite complex module, so I will try to give uh, to be fast. Um, well, uh, first an introduction, and then the, I will talk about the land and water submodule. Then Noelia will introduce the climate submodule, and then uh, I will come back with some results and example of the land part. Uh, well, the, this is the overview of the William model. Maybe you have seen it. And here is the our part, the land and water and the climate. And well, the, the land and water module and the climate module um, kind of work uh, together and they have relationship with the three main modules of the William model, with economy, with energy, and with society and, and demography. And these are the sub modules that uh, are forming this um, land module. Well, let's go a little bit to the main behavior of the module. Um, but first, um, I will let you talk about the focus of the um, environmental model. Because in other integrated assessment models, the main focus of the um, of the um, la, um, environmental models is emissions. So most integrated assessment models are based are oriented towards climate change. So the uh, land use changes are oriented to calculate the greenhouse emissions. But we wanted to broad the the scope of the model and focus on other things. Focus, for example, on food itself, on the nutrition of the world, on, on, on how to achieve this nutrition in, in the future, and focus on energy as well. On focusing on, on the limits to the energy expansion, to the limit to the energy obtained from forests, from biofuels, from, from the land, and also the impacts of uh, renewable energies on the territory. So, well, we have these um, three modules outside that give us some information, for example, the economy gives us the information of the estimated GDP and the society and the population. And based on this, we calculate the diets and the land products demand. So we have a, a quite a strong module of uh, demand of food uh, based on the evolution of the diets, based on, on the GDP and, of course, on the population. And uh, this enables some policies of dietary changes. And uh, based on the diets, we calculate the emission rate to animal farming that goes to the climate submodule. And here we have some policies of management of this um, uh, farming. Uh, the climate uh, model submodule calculates the atmospheric uh, carbon concentration and the temperature that feeds back into society and demography for indicators of well-being. Um, we also have the um, the, a model of land uses and crop production that gets the demand of crops and um, calculates uh, several things. For example, calculates the allocation of land into different land uses, the allocation of crop land into different crops, and also has an, a calculation of the evolution of yields. And based on the climate change impacts on, on, the, on the yields, and the demand of crops, it calculates the, the, the production. And here we have several policies, for example, policies of land protection of different uses, a policies of afforestation, urban density, agricultural management, and well, some others. Um, based on this uh, management, we calculate the amount of fertilizer that goes back to climate model, and also the crop production that goes to a model of uh, confrontation of demand and availability of uh, crops and other forestry products. And here we have two issues, which is the allocation between regions and uses. Because of course, locomotion is a model based on nine big regions. And the production in, in the world, the crops production travels a lot, and there's a lot of interchange between these regions. We are not building a model of the international trade of agricultural goods. This is something that uh, will be very nice, but at this stage, we are not able to do that. What we do is um, a confrontation of the global demand and the global availability per region. This is what we call a pool, a global pool of, of land products or a global pool of crops. 
because uh, we assume that uh, most of the countries contribute to this production. Well, all the regions contribute to a, a global allocation of, of food, and then all the regions demand. Uh, although there are some some production that we assume that is away from this global pool, and well, I will explain this a little bit later. And also the allocation between uses is quite important to see the competition between food, energy, and other uses for, for crops and for forestry products. And here we have some policies of um, several changes in this distribution and priorities. And uh, then, uh, based on this uh, confrontation of demand and availability, we have some indicators of uh, food availability or of energy availability for for biofuels, for example, no? because we confronted the demand of the energy model with the availability, and also the demand of forestry with um, with the availability of forest biomass based on these hypothetical distributions. Um, we also have calculated some. ¿Qué pasa aquí? Sorry. We shouldn't be here. Sorry, excuse me. Um, well, we have calculated some nutritional indicators. And there is also a um, confrontation of the demand of uh, energy of land for solar PV with uh, the land uses. And it, that feeds back into a warning of um, stress of solar land. And uh, the water model calculates some uh, stress of, uh, of uh, water based on the climate change um, uh, changes on the water availability. And there's a small module of uh, grasslands with some policies of carbon capture on agricultural soils, based, uh, basically on regenerative um, um, animal farming, animal uh, management. Uh, well, the, um, this model has some feedbacks because we are, we are in system dynamics and and of course feedbacks are quite important for for this kind of models the main feedbacks are are three uh, uh, we have the confrontation of um, of the demand and availability of crops that may give us a shortage of crops and this will need more land for to the land uses model and if this is done the land uses model gives us more more land for crops, so this uh, shortage is um, solved. And also there is another uh, feedback with the crops. So if we need more of a specific crop, for example, if we have more biofuels and we need more corn, more maize, then uh, the cropland model will allocate more land to this specific crop in order to solve this uh, demand and, and feed it back so that this is uh, correct. So this is not... Um, um, uh, William is not an equilibrium model no, where uh, the demand and the uh, availability is confronted via optimization, but this, this kind of issues are solved with uh, feedbacks, with this kind of feedback loops. And also we have another feedback. Uh, well, we have uh, some relationship between the, um, the shortage of land products and the diets. So if the... Um, if the diet cannot be met because there is not enough food in the in the production, the this um, lack of food is sent to the society as an indicator. Here we have no feedback, so the, there is a discrepancy between the demanded diet and the available diet. We haven't solved this uh, because it gave us uh, a lot of problems. Um, so that's why we decided not to make the feedback. It could be done, but the feedbacks in system dynamics are sometimes uh, difficult to solve and create a lot of problems in the model. So this, we, we accepted this as, a, as an indicator of the quality of the diet, more than a feedback. And there is also the feedback of uh, energy and land uses, so that if more land for solar is demanded, the land uses allocates more land for solar until it reaches a threshold that we consider sustainable. And then uh, the land tells the energy model to stop allocating solar land. Okay, uh, well, let me go with the land uh, and water submodules, and then I will explain this a little bit more in detail, and then Noelia will explain the climate part. Well, uh, we have several submodules 
uh, in, in this model, I have um, done this distribution in seven that I'm, I'm going to try to explain very briefly. Uh, the first one is the one of uh, land uses. The land is divided into these uh, categories that you have here, cropland, three categories, uh, two categories of cropland, three of forest, grassland, shrubland, urban land, solar, snow ice, water bodies, wetland, and, and other land. And uh, land use changes are driven by several factors. The first one is the trends of land use changes. And in this model, we, we try to capture the trends the historical trends of evolution of, of everything. So this is one of the main drivers. But then um, we also have the demand of land for human infrastructure that is calculated based on policies of uh, urban density. The demand of land for solar energy that comes from the energy model. The demand of cropland that comes from the demand of, um, of biofuels on, and food that comes from the diet model. The demand of forests, uh, of forest plantation, sorry. The policies of um, afforestation that demand more land for forest, and also policies of protection, the protection of primary forests, for example, or protection of cropland, etc. The um, climate change uh, gives us gives us the sea level rise, and well, of course, this demand of land have to be confronted with the availability of land because the land is limited; it is finite. So uh, we. Uh, took care to see where the land comes from, because uh, if you take land from an afforestation, it has to come from cropland, for example, or, or other uses. So uh, this um, consistency of the um, land, total amount of land is, um, is preserved. Well, this is a diagram of the land uses module. I'm not going to explain this kind of diagrams, but I thought uh, they are interesting for, for you. So um, they are in the presentation. Uh, let me present a little bit uh, an overview of the um, benzene program. Uh, this is a simplified part of the benzene program. It's very, very simplified, but just for you to, to see what's, what's inside if you take a look at it. We have uh, a stock of land use area um, per region. And uh, there is a matrix of land use changes that drives the land use a flow, no? the, the flows of land use from one to another. This matrix of land use changes tell us where the land comes from uh, and where the land goes. So that's why it's a matrix of, of land use. No? Land uses times land uses times regions as well. And uh, the demand is driven by trends on one hand and also on, um, on shortage and on demand, uh, for example, for cropland and for solar PV. And this uh, demand that this comes from these two sources is confronted. And uh, then we have um, a matrix as well of shares that tell us where the land comes from. So for example, when we demand land for urban land, uh, this amount of land comes may come from forest land or from grassland or from cropland. So we divide this um, demand of land into the different uses that provide this land with these shares of, of land. And then finally, some uses are driven by mainly by climate change or external policies. So the, the, the uses that come from this allocation are mainly the productive uses. Well, um, the diet and land products demand submodel is also quite developed, especially in the part of diets. We have studied the um, historical evolution of diets with GDP per capita, dividing the diets into uh, 15 products. So if the GDP grows, the amount of meat, for example, uh, grows in most region or has grown in most region. For example, you can see here in China, the meat from ruminants has grown quite a lot uh, with GDP. So we try to preserve or to maintain this trend uh, and, and relate diet to GDP, unless policies of diet cha dietary changes are introduced. So, well, this is uh, some of the, um, of the regions. You see that some regions are below the standards of um, a minimum, uh, what we call here, flexitarian diet, which is a, a half vegetarian diet, a, a diet with less meat. No? Okay, uh, well, this is the, um, the diagram of the diet submodule. And uh, well, I'm not explaining this, sorry. And 
And here is a, well, a, a quick overview. Here we have the GDP per capita um, and the patterns of diet evolution per region. And based on this um, GDP, we calculate a diet according to income. And there is a stock of change to desired diet if we uh, decide to put a policy of diet change in the model. Um, based on these things, we calculate the diet of the households and the land products demand. The meat obtained from grasslands and the, uh, the fish is uh, separated because it comes from from other, it, this is not land products, no, it's not coming from the land. Well, um, the um, crop land suit model works with the crop land that is decided in the land uses sub model. No? So first we divide the land into land uses and then uh, we allocate the crop land into different crops. So we have these uh, crops uh, divided into the groups that you have here. Um, and um, uh, we have uh, two options, either separate irrigated and refed crop, cropland or um, use all the cropland together. Well, this is uh, again the diagram where we, we have this switch that separates into um, cropland all together or um, or um, or all uh, or divided into uh, uh, raised and 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 uh, uh, irrigated. The reason to separate between irrigated and and uh, raised crops or not to separate is because of data. We have a lot of problems trying to find the data of the yields and of the amount of land dedicated to each uses because we have several sources of data and finally we decided to use uh, FAO data and uh, for FAO there is no separation between irrigated and cropland and rainfed cropland sorry so that's why we decided to use right now the um, all the cropland together so right now the the model calibrated and with results that we assume is uh, are okay is uh, not separating between irrigated and crop and rainfed. In the future, maybe if we can find better data, we can do the, the data with uh, separating rainfed and irrigated. Okay, so well, um, in order to, to see the main dynamics of this model, well, we can see that the, the drivers of um, crop changes are based on the relative demand of, of each crop. So, well, we, this is a quite physical model, uh, that is not using prices in in the um, at least in the land and water module because uh, well right now we don't dare to use prices although the driver of these changes could could be changed to something more related to prices in the future if we if we rely on that and if we think it's, it's feasible but right now we, we thought that it was too early to introduce economical variables in this model so it's just based on the relative demand of each crop that comes from the rest of the model. And this relative demand of the crops drives the changes of uh, land into different crops. So uh, we take these shares of crops that gives us the, the percentage of the cropland that is dedicated to each crop in each region. And uh, we have calculated a matrix of changes that tell us uh, how much amount of uh, crop co comes from one crop, so, I'm sorry, of cropland goes from one crop to another. Um, the dynamics uh, for this is quite uh, tricky because we have to ensure that the, the amount of land is not more than 100%, no? It's, um, so that the, the one that gives uh, the the changes of lands are are preserved. No, this and this mechanism is done in Vensi with a mechanism that we have uh, developed and we call it dynamic shares. It is a type of allocation many to many. If if some of you know Vensi, uh, you know that Vensi has some functions of allocation. One is the allocation one to many, and another is the many to many based on market prices. Um, but well, these uh, mechanisms were not very suitable for our problems, so we developed a, a different mechanism of allocation many to many uh, that is based on these drivers of uh, uh, the la relative demand. This mechanism is uh, very nice and enables us to do um, a, an allocation of the crops so on, on the on, on of the land on different crops. So well, we, finally, this matrix of changes 
collapses into a vector of changes that then fits the, the stock of shares of crops. And based on the share of the cropland among crops and based on the cropland area, we calculate the, the crops production amount of crops. Of course, there is a factor of maximum crops for, for some specific crop. We have set a limit of the share that can be used for that based on on the physical expansion of, uh, of, of the most uh, relevant crops. Well, uh, then we, we, uh, we switch to the yield uh, submodel. The yield submodel is also based on the observation of the trees of, of yield growth. Uh, well, these are, these are the trends of um, the historical data and the trend, the continuation of the trend of the yields of several crops at world level. This is the world average. Uh, well, it's uh, quite difficult to know what's going to be the future evolution of the yields. Right now, we are trying to set what the limits are and reviewing the literature. We haven't concluded that yet. Uh, but uh, the model enables us to follow the trends or to set the limit to the trends. So the model is already programmed to set this limit, although I must say that the, the, the setup of these limits is still ongoing. Uh, but well, uh, we can play with it and, and see what happens if the limit is in, in, a, in, a, in a place or in another. Um, and the uh, agricultural base yields are calculated based on this uh, evolution, this future or expected evolution. Also, the effects of climate change on, on yields are expected to be on, on, on the model, although we, I must say that we were not able to set them. This was um, a, in charge of the CREAF uh, team, and they did a, a good work, but they, they couldn't conclude it because of some difficulties with with um, rain, with rain patterns. So this is a work that is still ongoing. And we also have the effects of the type of management um, and some policies that enables enable us to change this management in the future. For example, a, a lot of land in the world is still in many regions is based on traditional agriculture with low inputs, for example, in India and in East Asia and Latin America. Um, and then we also have the agriculture with high inputs, which is the one that we have in developing nations. Uh, but, but we also uh, assume that maybe in the future, the lack of um, fertilizers or oil-based inputs may force the agriculture, the industrial agriculture, to change. You know? For example, we may think of an oil shock, you know, as I say, that, 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 that we have to um, to change to that. Um, and also we developed some policies to change to an, an agroecology management with low input so that uh, in order to avoid this oil shock where we have an agriculture with low yields because we are forced to, we can develop a, um, an agriculture with low inputs. Well, so this kind of um, uh, uh, this uh, management is considered in the model and what we do is um, these um, stocks, which are stocks of different amounts of uh, agriculture, different management of agriculture. This is the share of traditional agriculture, for example, in, uh, in one country, the share of industrial agriculture, the share of uh, low input agriculture farms, but an oil shock, and the share of um, regenerative agriculture. And there is an evolution between these shares um, right now, mainly based on policies, but in the future, maybe we are planning to link the price of oil and gas, for example, in this in this share of uh, from industrial to low input, and and of course the um, the evolution of this is um, based on a reasonable a reasonable a hypothesis. Uh, that the states that the the regenerative agriculture takes time. So this transition from industrial agriculture or traditional agriculture or low input agriculture into regenerative agriculture takes a time. And that's why we put this stock of um, agriculture in transition. And based on all this, we have the, an effect of management on, on yields that uh, goes back to the yield 
um, well, or adds up to the yields given by trends. Um, and then we also have a, a model of forests because we are very concerned about forest degradation and the limits uh, to forest extraction. And uh, we use a model of uh, wood content uh, and a model that includes the wood extraction into the into the limits. No? And this um, model is based on a volume of uh, stock of forest, volume of wood stock in the forests. Uh, it's based on a, a model that we found in the literature. And this takes into account the vegetation growth and um, the volume of forest loss because of deforestation and also the wood lost because of human extraction. And all this goes into, into the flow of forests extracted and then finally calculates the stocks. Uh, here we can set some policies of uh, limits to wood extraction based on the minimum stock that we want to protect and that goes back to the uh, energy module. And then we have uh, also a model of uh, water availability and water demand driven by the population, the industry, and the agriculture. Here we have um, the population gives us the demand of water for households and the industry, the demand, the economy, sorry, the, the demand of water for, for economy, and then the water availability is calculated based mainly on climate change scenarios. Um, and the demand of water is um, for industry, sorry, is calculated uh, subtracting the demand of uh, water for households and, and industry to the total availability. And, and then based on RCP scenarios, we calculate the, the uh, water available, no? the evapotranspiration and ch um, precipitation changes expected. And uh, this gives us the water availability that can be compared with the demand to give a signal of water stress. And well, um, based on this the demand and availability, we, we have uh, the confrontation of, of demand and availability, um, mainly for crops and forestry products. And well, uh, there is a, we need to allocate between regions and also between uses. The allocation between region is, as I told you, not a model of international trade, but it's a model of confrontation of the demand of of the food demanded for the population of one region versus the production in per region or the production in, in, in the world. Um, and this enables us to do some policies of agricultural protection uh, in some regions, because right now some, some of the production in the world cannot be considered to be globally traded or globally influenced by, by global trade, no? because it depends on very small farmers that they are mainly based on subsistence agriculture. So this uh, subsistence agriculture is removed from this international allocation. And also we can think that in the future, the world may develop into a more protect protectionism world where the globalization of food uh, trade is, um, is uh, restricted. So maybe, for example, we can assume that China stops uh, uh, exporting rice, for example, what happens if this this is um, happening in one region? So, well, the model enables us to play with that, with the the, the trade of 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 food in 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 a sense. Um, and well, for for this, of course, we rely on trends. So, in order to calibrate the standard, the baseline, and then we have have this hypothetical policies of trade protection. And the distribution among uses is the um, distribution of crops between energy and, and food, basically, and forestry <coughs> <coughs> products into energy and materials. Mm. Well, this is the diagram, and, uh, and well, this is the um, a little bit of uh, of the confrontation of land products you know, in the uh, diagram, a simplified diagram. Here we have the share of production from smallholders from that is protected from the from the international trade. This may change due to policies. And uh, here we have the products that are allocated to global pool, no? the, the, the ones that we assume that are traded, subtracting this share from smallholders. And this gives us the land products available to region. 
And using a function uh, allocate one too many, we allocate these products into um, different regions. And once they are um, allocated among regions, they are confronted with the demand by region in order to be allocated uh, to uses. So we demand, we are calculate the demand for food, for energy, for industry, and divide it also with a function allocate one too many. Uh, well, finally, I'm going to give the floor to Noelia so that she can explain the climate uh, suit model. Well, the land related emissions are the ones regarding the land use, land use change, and forestry emissions, and then the agriculture ones. Uh, so at the end, what we have is land use change emissions that are linked to the land use sub module that Margarita has explained. So based on the difference of area from one year to another and the type of land use change, for example, is different from uh, forest to urban, that from forest to grassland, uh, we calculate uh, the carbon emissions related to land use changes. Then we also uh, have information that about forest growth and based on the forest module that Margarita has explained. So we also calculate uh, the carbon uptake by forest and how it con uh, translated to, to carbon emissions, um, carbon uptake in this case. And then as Margarita has explained, we have a different type of agriculture practice in croplands and also in grasslands. So this is uh, translated into carbon emissions regarding the changes of carbon in soil due to the different type of uh, agricultural practice that are applied. In regarding to agriculture emissions, um, we calculated the livestock emissions. The, in this case, the link with the land uh, module is based on the diets and land produce demands module that has been explained. As you know, we have information about the food consumption, which is then translated also uh, aligned with the FAO data from this uh, food consumption and animals production in order to obtain the stock of living animals because the living animals are the ones that emit. And so we calculate the methane emissions from enteric fermentation from rumians and also the nitrosocyte and methane emissions from, from manual management. In this case, we also are able to apply policies of different type of management which uh, influence the, the emissions, of course, if it's managed as solid storage or as, as other types. And then we have also emissions based on synthetic fertilizers that comes from the yields module that Marga has explained. So we have different type of agriculture practice. This means that we have different inputs applied to uh, the cropland that uh, tra traduces into uh, nitros, uh, nitrogen applied into cropland, nitrosocyte emissions related to, to these to this different type of agriculture practices. And also we have emissions uh, from the area of irrigated or rain-fed rice, that is uh, methane emissions from rice cultivation. So this is very quick. Uh, some examples have been seen views, uh, the structure uh, simplified, going to be very quick. Uh, this is uh, the land use change emissions. Of course, uh, there is a delay in time, time because it's not immediately emitted in some cases. So, and the main thing is the link with the, with the land use part that Margarita has explained. That is the input to calculate these emissions. And also in the, in the case of agriculture, we have a different type of management from agriculture practices that translate it into nitrogen applied. And also we have different area of irrigated rice and rainfed rice that translated into methane emissions. And the same with the diets that in, uh, influence the livestock emissions. But this is a simplified diagram, so it's <laughs> more developing in benzene views. And then regarding the climate part, uh, just to, to mention that it's based on sea roads, this is a simple climate model that has been improved and, and adapted uh, into into William. So first of all, the first part is the emissions, that is the input to the climate uh, module of William. 
not only the land related emissions that I have just explained, the, the green ones, but also from other models, as the, for example, the energy one, that also includes the energy and transport uh, related emissions. Uh, so we calculate most of the carbon meters on site and methane emissions endogenous Leon William, and also we add some other emissions, exogenous emissions into William in order to enter into the greenhouse gas cycles. We have the carbon cycle based on zeros very, very uh, developed and more simplified the other greenhouse gas cycles. But the objective is to obtain the carbon concentration in the atmosphere and other greenhouse gases concentration in the atmosphere. This data, this output is what allow us to calculate the total radiative forcing that is the one uh, mentioned in the RCP uh, pathways, if you are familiar with that. And is what allow us to calculate the global mean temperature. That is one of also the main outputs of the climate uh, the climate models. So at the end, with the carbon concentration in the atmosphere, we are able to calculate uh, some impacts as, such as the ocean acidification, and with the global mean temperature, also uh, the global sea level rise. But uh, as Margarita has explained, we have different regions in William. Uh, and climate change impacts are very particular to each region, to each climate uh, uh, conditions of each region. So we also in the, in, the, in the project distributed the regional, the global temperature into the regions, into the regions to obtain regional temperature values uh, in order to uh, serve as a link to model climate in, impacts in other parts of the model, in particular. In the land and water parts that Margarita has explained, we have these uh, climate change impacts. Some of them are ongoing work, as Margarita has explained. So, for example, impacts on water availability, on the forest production, on the area occupied by sea level rise, agricultural area occupied by sea level rise. This is already included, and the effects on crop yields that is ongoing, as Margarita has explained. So. This is just an example. I'm not going to enter into, into detail because this uh, is uh, too much, but of a benzene view that includes the carbon cycle. As, uh, as I have said, is the more developed. So it's very complex, but we have also another uh, greenhouse gas cycles. So we have the carbon uptake by biosphere, also by uh, the ocean. And even as we are, uh, we have the, the uh, system dynamics uh, tool also, there is some feedbacks about how uh, the effect of warming or of temperature change or temperature increase also affect the carbon cycle. So there is some important feedbacks also in the climate uh, part. And I'm going to be very quick, some results as a, or from a business as usual scenario. This is the scenario which uh, trends from the paths are kept. So not additional policies are applied, additional climate policies. So we can see uh, some important uh, outputs from the climate modules, so as, as, such as the uh, carbon dioxide concentration compared with, uh, with historical information that is increasing, of course. Uh, also the global temperature change, that is an important output, as I said before, because it can be compared with the Paris Agreement goals. Uh, in the business as usual scenario, uh, we have, for example, uh, surpassed the limit of one degree and a half from the Paris Agreement goal before mid-century, and nearly the two degrees, uh, the two degrees of the the limit of the Paris uh, Agreement uh, goals. In the case of the distribution of this temperature, global temperature change between regions, we have a different outputs. You can see that they are higher, so. On the different uh, regions of William, we have higher temperature, and this is because the land, the land, the territory, uh, warm up faster than the ocean, and the global temperature change that uh, is the the famous Paris Agreement goals are is an average of ocean and land. That is why we have more impacts, more temperature increase in in the ter territory. And then we have another important uh, output, as I have said before, like the ocean acidification, the, the, P, the pH uh, decrease, and the, and the sea level rise. And now I leave the floor again to, to Margarita. Uh, 
Uh, thank you, Noelia. Uh, well, I, let me just uh, very quickly uh, go to some, yeah, some, a ver. sorry, this is not working. A ver, no, okay. Uh, well, this is uh, Noelia's, sorry. I'm, I'm trying to show you some results of what the, the, um, the land model can do very quick. For example, we can think on, on the food problem and in order to see if there is enough food, we, we, there are several factors that can be touched in the model. For example, the demand of crop for energy, the population, the diet, the cropland available, the yields, the type of management, the availability of agricultural inputs, the impacts of climate change, the priorities of distribution of crops and the um, among uses and, and, things, and, and regions. For example, in, in this example, I will use the, the trends of population. The GDP will be um, will be drive, driving the population, and I will introduce some policies of dietary changes. The crop the cropland available. Uh, I will assume, for example, that it can grow or it cannot grow, and the yields as well. I will set an example with constant yield and another with growing yield. Um, I will use also some policies of change to regenerative um, and also an oil shock in the agriculture will be programmed. Uh, the impacts on climate change on yields is, is not assumed and the priorities amount of distributions are also kept as uh, business as usual. And the demand of crop or biofuels will have three uh, options. And um, I, there is an indicator of global avail availability of crops that will be used. This is just a comparison of global availability at world level, adding all the products and uh, dividing crops available between crops demanded. So if there is, if it is less than one, there is what we can call shortage compared to today's situation. So we assume that the historical situation has uh, a one value so that all that is demanded is available. And if it is less than one, it means that the shortage of food is less or is worse than today. Uh, so, for example, what happens if we uh, continue the trends of biofuel use and there is no increase in yields or cropland? So, if we do that, then in the future we may have this availability of crops. So, there is less than one because of the population growth and there has been no increase in yields or cropland. So, this is quite normal. No? Um, what happens if we stop using biofuels on that? Well, then we will have a different curve with, of course, less uh, shortage of food. Uh, what happens if we um, we let the demand of biofuel grow so that in two, 250, we have 50% of the food oil for transportation substituted by biofuels? Okay, so this is what we have, no? for example. Uh, what happens if we have a, an oil shortage so that the... Um, uh, all the agriculture uh, stops having uh, oil in, in 250. So of course the situation is a lot worse because the yields decrease because of this lack of fertilizers. Well, these are just some trials for you to see what the model can do. No, it's, uh, don't pay too much attention to the numbers because these are very preliminary results and it's very hypothetical scenarios. Uh, and for example, what we can do with the model is trying to solve this by increasing the yields and increasing the amount of land. So we can see in two scenarios, in the no bios, no, with no biofuels, and in the one with 30% of the transportation with biofuels, how much land we will need and how much yield we will need in order to solve this problem. So, well, okay, we can calculate this. For example, in the no bios, it's 19% more yields. In the high bios, we will need something that may not be very easy to achieve, 34% increase in yields and almost 30% more land. No? So we can have an estimation on how difficult our, our task is. Um, so this is the expected evolution of yields and, and the total cropland area needed is quite uh, heavy, no? this, uh, this amount of, of land. So although we haven't set realistic limits to, to these yields, we already can see that the tasks that we are presenting are quite uh, difficult. And also the diet changes can be introduced. For example, we use this flexitarian diet that has less uh, meat in general, more 
well, a, a leaf or fruits and vegetables than the one that are, we are eating now in the European Union, and more fruits and legumes than than today. Okay, if we use we change the world to this diet. Uh, well, what happens in the previous scenarios with a change of diet? Well, we can see, you know, for example, with with uh, no biofuels, we have even um, and dietary changes, we have uh, an excess of production. So we get even better than today. With the baseline um, at the end of the century, we can do it. Um, but with um, a lot of biofuels, oil shock and dietary changes, we cannot achieve um, a, a, a zero shortage, you know, because it's the, 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 the task is too heavy you know, in order to overcome it, even with uh, these strong dietary changes. Um, and well, finally, we have the same scenarios, some of them, with uh, an oil and gas shock and dietary changes so, all together. Well, these are the results. No? Of course, the dynamics of the um, oil shock and the regenerative um, alternative is captured here in the model because uh, the solution of the regenerative uh, agriculture has this delay that is, uh, is used in the model. Well, this is just some results that, uh, that I want to give an overview of what the model can do. Uh, and of course, don't take them as uh, general uh, final results because we still have to do some work in order to a, a review or data, send them to peer review journals and and, and really refine the, the, the data. No? This is a quite brand new module and and of course is um, is there is a lot of um, detailed work still to do on in order to get the final results. But well I, I think that the, this is a quite novel new uh, module that enables us to address and analyze a wide variety of land and food related policies uh, with all the land use limits uh, for for solar PV, the land protection, the, the, the limits of forest extraction, uh, the crops and agriculture management. I think we have done some some th things that are quite new in the in the field of, of integrated assessment models taking more care of, of these different types of uh, agriculture management and the possible transitions. And also the, the, the diets and the demand of land products is quite details. Um, and then the, the demand of forestry products is, uh, is one of the things that we want to address quite heavily. And also uh, it, it also keeps the capacity to analyze and a broad sense of greenhouse emissions so, because it's also, uh, it's not, um, missing these capacities to, to see all the important greenhouse emissions and the cycles of this of these gases. And well thank you very much for your attention and I hope we have some some time round now for quick questions. Sorry for being so 